I'm Tim Ventura from AmericanAntiGravity.com, and this is a follow-up interview with Dr. Eugene Poglanoff, world-famous Russian physicist and chemist known for his work into gravitational waves and gravity beam generation. During our previous interview, Dr. Poglanoff told us that he'd been able to generate hundreds of pounds of force in beams of pure gravitational energy, and we're conducting a follow-up interview to learn a little bit more about the details of his experiment. Uh, Dr. Poglanoff, can you hear me okay? I read you perfectly. One of the responses that we had online was, uh, with nearly a decade of experience, why haven't we been able to see video or photos of your experiments up until now? Uh, well, first of all, when I began uh, those experiments in Finland, in Tampere, uh, it's not a habit here uh, in Finland to make any videos or photos of the equipment or of the experiment. It's typical for the United States, but here in Europe it's a bit uh, different. And the same thing uh, goes for Russia, uh, especially with the last experiment uh, in the um, Moscow Chemical Research Center, because uh, the whole center is uh, a very complicated structure, and some of the works are closed for wide public. They're not secret, but they're simply dangerous because we use uh, high voltage, uh, several million volts, so they're closed. And uh, 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 well, we have special signs on the walls of the laboratory which do not allow to make any photos. It's the policy which is accepted at this uh, scientific uh, center. So I didn't want to change the rules. Oh, absolutely. Well, in light of the publicity that you've had recently, have you given thought to doing any photos or video in the near future? Uh, I think uh, I will try to make uh, something. Uh, I discussed uh, this possibility uh, with the administration. They think it might be possible, but uh, at present, we have uh, no videos and uh, no photos at all. Oh, okay. Well, I look forward uh, to hopefully receiving some in the future, um, you know, I if it turns out that it is possible. Well, to move along, um, have you been able to obtain uh, funding from government or private interests? Has there been uh, a fair amount of interest that's come forward and uh, tried to provide some funding for your experiments? Uh, there is a certain interest uh, from uh, several circuits, but it's a private sector mainly, because uh, governmental policy towards uh, all the research in the field of gravity and experimental gravity um, is uh, it's not a popular trend, so uh, we don't get much money from the government. Uh, of course, we use the uh, red installations at the Technological Center, but... Um, there is uh, some interest uh, in general all over the world and in the United States and Great Britain, but uh, uh, we didn't get any funding from the government. Uh, we get uh, a rather small funding from uh, private sector, as I mentioned, but uh, our plans are, are really amazing and uh, we need um, considerable funding. So this uh, topic, uh, gravity, is... Uh, First of all, it is a bit unusual, and uh, we need some exotic material, we need uh, special installations, we need cryogenic systems, uh, also we need uh, the help of people who are uh, top qualified in their own areas, and uh, this all uh, costs a lot. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, with, uh, with the actual testing, one of the questions that had occurred to me when I was, you know, when I sat down and took a little bit of time was, um, it, you know, as these are presumed to be gravity beams, have you noticed any time effects? Um, uh, it's uh, difficult to say because uh, it's not uh, practically a gravity beam, it's a gravity impulse, so it's very short in time. And because of these limitations, as it is short in time, we didn't notice any time effects and didn't even try to measure. Maybe they're present. Uh, they are definitely present when we are working with the rotating disks, definitely, and uh, we had some, inf uh, some experience with this, but with uh, gravity impulse generator we simply didn't organize any measurements. Absolutely, that, that makes perfect sense. Well, you know, I, I was wondering on a personal note, um, you'd mentioned that this was uh, over hundreds of pounds of force for a very short period of time. And I'd wondered, um, has, this, uh, has this been able to punch holes through lightweight substances, or 
is it more of just kind of a motion on them? Uh, it all depends on the uh, voltage that we apply and also on the structure of the superconducting emitter. Uh, so at the maximum possibility of our materials at present, uh, we can obtain um, rather um, big impulses, so they are able uh, to deform uh, metal plates uh, with a thickness of a couple of inches, and uh, they are able to make holes in concrete walls, uh, so uh, we are not speaking about some lightweight substances, but concrete wall is uh, something very solid. Oh. And uh, they deform metal uh, in the way that uh, a hydraulic press might do it, uh, but the impulse is very short in time, so uh, of course we can uh, build a system and use several uh, MUX uh, generators, so we can uh, give a series of impulses that will uh, definitely improve the situation. But uh, at present we can uh, treat different materials uh, with uh, our uh, gravity uh, impulse generator and also what is important that uh, we can um, hit different objects at big distances absolutely well you know in in terms of uh, putting holes through concrete it makes sense that the holes would remain but with metals after the metal is deformed do they snap back after the beam is gone or do they remain deformed no they just uh, remain deformed it's just uh, like a um, very uh, like a punch, uh, very short in time, so it's an, uh, close to um, an explosion action, something like this. Oh, okay, okay. I, you know, I'm, I'm planning on buying um, a small superconductor and testing some myself, hopefully. Um, I, I don't have a 5 million volt system, I think 5,000 with a very high amperage. So hopefully, I, I doubt that it would do metals, but I thought maybe paper might be something to experiment with and see uh, if I can... Well, I, I think it's possible. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll definitely have to move forward with that. Um, well, one of the things I was wondering about was whether you've been able to do efficiency calculations for the force beam. Uh, well, Giovanni Modernese uh, calculated uh, uh, some preliminary, made some preliminary measurements and uh, gave the forces uh, in joules, but... Um, we practically uh, did not try to calculate, uh, we wanted to simply to see the results and how the different objects uh, uh, react to the uh, action of this impulse. So we didn't uh, make any precise calculations. Oh, okay. Um, you'd mentioned in the past that this tends to defy conventional relativity theory. I was wondering if you might have any specific examples of things that caught your eye as maybe being not right or outside of what the theory predicts. Well, first of all, I didn't say that uh, our experiments defy conventional relativity theory, no. Um, they don't. But uh, if we uh, speak about uh, uh, the experiment with the rotating disks, I simply mentioned that uh, uh, we're uh, rotating uh, metal uh, or superconducting objects at very high speed and uh, as this uh, rotation um, around uh, its own axis is um, not... Uh, uh, it's an um, absolute uh, rotation, so it's uh, absolute movement, it's not relative. That's why the uh, relativity theory is not applicable uh, to our rotating disks, because it's entirely a different thing. Oh, okay. So it just doesn't apply, but it, it doesn't invalidate it at all. That, no, no. I, I should apologize for getting that one incorrect. Um, oh, does the, uh, does the inertia change in proportion to changes in mass? The, the, the reason that I kind of wrote that down was really in relation to um, Fran Diakino's research, and he believes that these aren't equal, that they just tend to appear equal to, to us in our frame of reference. But I, I was... Oh, I, I'm sorry. Well, uh, according to our understanding and our experience, uh, we did not make any difference between uh, gravitational and inertial mass, so we think that they are equal. 
also in case uh, with the uh, impulses, the impulses are too short in time uh, to make uh, to notice any difference. And we didn't make any special experiments just uh, to distinguish uh, gravitational and inertial mass. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, in in terms of uh, the actual emitter, the superconductor. Um, you know, I read the experimental write-up. I believe it was. 47 millimeters, if I remember correctly. But I, I was wondering if changing the size or shape affects the beam output. Maybe makes it stronger or uh, refocuses it, perhaps? Uh, well, if we speak about the size of the superconductor, uh, there are some limitations. Uh, uh, the diameter of the superconductor shouldn't be uh, smaller than 4 inches. Uh, uh, because of the uh, Schwarz, uh, Schwarzschild's radius. And uh, if we speak about the shape, well, uh, uh, the superconductor can in fact uh, have different shapes and uh, the impulse will uh, repeat uh, the projection of uh, a certain shape. So it is important. Oh, okay. Well, that may rule out my experiment. I the, the largest I've seen online, I think, is a one-inch superconductor in the United States, at least. So, I'm not sure if they sell four-inch ones. Although, if they did, it would be worth the money. Um, well, it, it, it's very important. Uh, we uh, didn't get any uh, good results with uh, smaller superconductors, and also it's um, much more difficult to get a flat discharge with uh, the superconductors that are small in diameter. Oh, okay. Well, um, have you noticed any changes in uh, the molecular structure or uh, maybe compression for the targets that you've sent the beam through? Um, like you'd mentioned, um, metals deforming and uh, holes through concrete. Um, on a uh, yeah, uh, we did not uh, see any um, compression effects or any change of the molecular structure. It remains the same as it was. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's just a large-scale deformation from force, but not anything internal, then? No, nothing internal. Oh, um, oh I, I should ask if the beam loses energy as it penetrates materials. Um, does, it, does it naturally decrease with distance? But, but, um... uh, well, that's an interesting question, and uh, to our great surprise, and we made a lot of discharges, so the installation was working for um, about... Uh, for years now, uh, the beam practically does not uh, lose energy uh, when it meets uh, um, the materials. It can pass through the brick wall or concrete uh, or metal plates, very thick ones, and uh, plastic materials also. It seems that uh, it doesn't lose energy at all, which uh, seems a bit strange, but uh, uh, we don't want to break any laws, and uh, simply the system where we are working, it's not a closed one. Therefore, the second law of thermodynamics is again uh, not applicable here. And if we speak about uh, the action uh, uh, with the distance, the dependence of the energy on the distance, um, uh, we don't have uh, much experimental data, but uh, what we have now is a first measurement uh, at uh, the distance of 1.2 kilometers, and uh, there is uh, no uh, loss of energy. And the latest experiments, uh, the distance was 5 kilometers, and uh, the beam penetrated uh, through several houses, uh, which, made, which were made of uh, concrete. So we did not uh, measure any uh, loss of energy. Uh, but um, uh, according to some calculations and uh, the evaluations that we made, uh, with a distance of more than uh, 100 kilometers, we should get uh, some decrease uh, of the energy. So it's uh, this work awaits us in the future. Oh, okay. I, you know, as well, you'd mentioned five kilometers. Did you notice any change in the focus of the beam? Uh, did it did it widen or perhaps get smaller um, as it as it travels? Uh, if uh, uh, the main solenoid, which is uh, wound uh, around the chamber, is made in a good way, then we have a very good discharge, and uh, practically uh, it 
uh, it uh, contains the same uh, form uh, as it was. Uh, but uh, with a distance of five kilometers, we notice that there is uh, uh, the, the beam is not so focused. It's uh, it goes a bit uh, a bit wider uh, than. It, it was so uh, there are some deviations uh, in the in the shape of the impulse it becomes a bit wider oh okay um you know one of the i collected a few questions online and uh um one person had written me um is it possible to generate more work along the path of the beam than energy put into the beam i, I think they were asking about potential over unity applications but uh, well, uh, it's, it's surprising uh, that uh, um, uh, the energy that we put uh, inside the discharge uh, it's uh, much less uh, than the energy uh, which uh, the impulse produces and uh, the work that it can um, make uh, is uh, bigger than the energy that we put inside the beam. But that doesn't mean uh, it's an over-unity device. Simply, uh, we um, create the conditions when the interactions of uh, magnetic uh, field and electric field and uh, special uh, behavior of the Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, so with all these parameters, we provide the interaction of uh, the fields and of the material with the subatomic particles. Uh, we may call it um, zero point energy or whatever it is or ether uh, but um, anyway uh, when uh, normal matter uh, interacts uh, with uh, subatomic particles uh, special energy is uh, obtained and uh, we can use this energy so our installation is like a key which uh, opens the energy of the subatomic particles. Uh, this is at least our explanation. Sure, sure. Well, and it sounds like it is kind of opening up, m perhaps in some ways, more energy than is immediately available. Um, yeah, that's right. Also, uh, we are not speaking about any closed system. This system is an open one, and uh, we don't break any laws from our point of view. Oh, okay. Well, you had mentioned that you're uh, actually working on some publications, and I, I guess in some ways that kind of ruins my next question that I've collected online. Um, th they'd asked if you're going to publish more in the near future. Uh, well, uh, of course, the interest uh, to this uh, problem is um, growing in all the countries. Uh, we got a very um, interesting offer from uh, China. From They have a special... A project at the University of Beijing and uh, there is a certain interest uh, from uh, the private sector in the United States so as soon as we uh, get the funding we will try to organize all these um, experiments in a more detailed way uh, but uh, uh, at present uh, what is extremely interesting that we measured or we tried to measure the interaction of uh, this beam uh, with the light and uh, uh, some preliminary results were published uh, last year in the Journal of Low Temperature Physics. Uh, it was in August. It's my article with Giovanni Modanese. And uh, we continue this work now. And also we tried uh, to measure uh, the speed, uh, the propagation speed of the impulse. And we are very cautious about it because we don't want uh, to frighten uh, the scientific community and also we want to be absolutely sure that the results um, were checked and rechecked uh, several tens of times. But it seems that um, based on what we have now, and uh, we already were working for a year and a half, uh, on this, uh, the speed of the impulse uh, is much higher than the speed of light. And uh, uh, with the parameters that we use now, with the present emitters and uh, the voltage of uh, three uh, and uh, five million volts, uh, the speed uh, is about uh, 63, 64 C, uh, which means that um, the propagation speed of the impulse is uh, close to, it is 
practically uh, 64 times faster than the speed of light. But um, we would like, uh, of course, uh, to measure all uh, these uh, parameters using different uh, measurement uh, systems, different approaches. At present, we used two atomic clock, and uh, we think that our experiments were precise enough. But we would welcome, of course, uh, the advice of the international community and uh, the advice on how to measure the speed of the impulse in a very precise way. Yeah. As soon as we get uh, good confirmation of the results, uh, we will try to publish all this information. Oh, okay. So there's definitely more coming along. You know, one thing that I found helps with the lifter experiments and others that I've conducted, and again, if you you know, once you reach the point of taking film, um, I found that film analysis helps a lot, at least for my experiments. And one of my favorites has been working with smoke and cloud chambers. And, uh, you know, by, by stopping the tape and rewinding, I found that I can find a lot of little things going on that I never noticed at the, you know, at the time I filmed it. So, you know, perhaps that may be something that'll be valuable if, if you're able to bring a camera in and get some photos. Yes, that's a very good approach. We'll take it into consideration, of course. Well, um, you know, I, I was wondering, uh, you'd mentioned that there's interest from the private sector in the United States and from China, but do you know if there are any duplication efforts or replications underway by other groups for your, your research? Uh, I know that uh, there, there was a big interest uh, in Boeing, but uh, I don't know their secrets. And I know that... Uh, the Department of Defense in the United States is also interested in this program, and that's why they invited uh, Dr. Ning Li uh, to lead the scientific uh, laboratory. Uh, but uh, at present, I don't know any uh, official replication of uh, my gravity experiments, mainly because they are uh, hard to organize, they are rather costly, and uh, the official attitude uh, of the, let's say, it's politically correct science to this problem is negative, so it creates a lot of um, difficulties. But I don't hide anything, and uh, if people uh, contact me directly or by email, I usually try to give uh, all the advice uh, that I have and to share all the uh, experience. Because the problem is too complicated for one country or for one lab um, to succeed. And uh, the gravity should be studied uh, all over the world using uh, the best forces and the brains of different scientists. That's the key to success. Hey, absolutely. Well, and I've always had great success in terms of contacting you, and you've always been incredibly helpful with my questions. And, and so I'm sure others will have a, a similar experience. But... Um, you know, one of the obstacles to independent replications, it sounds like, is the 4-inch superconductor. Do you know if those are manufactured and sold anywhere, or is it a process that everyone has to go through to build their own? Uh, well, uh, frankly speaking, it's uh, a part of my know-how, but uh, if we speak about uh, extremely uh, effective emitters, but uh, normal emitters uh, which allow simply uh, to measure uh, small effects, it's not a problem, and uh, I think that um, American superconductor can help uh, easily uh, to make the emitters of this kind. Also, there is um, a nice firm called uh, Superconductive Components uh, in Ohio, Columbus, in the United States, and they are more or less familiar with my technology, and they can, uh, I think, make their good con contribution to this. Oh, okay. So essentially, by using a smaller superconductor, you have a smaller effect, but that can be tested using more sensitive equipment. Um, well, uh, still, uh, the diameter of the disc should be not less than four inches. Uh, no, I speak about the structure. The structure for very efficient uh, emitters uh, is a bit uh, difficult, and uh, it takes a lot of experience to achieve this structure. So uh, even if I give the detailed de description, uh, it's a bit difficult to make it without my help. But uh, you know, with uh, normal emitters, uh, which allow you to push uh, a thick book um, away from the table, it's possible to make it. It's not so complicated. Oh, okay, okay. Well, um, 
you know, I had one other question about, um, it, this person was also asking about video, but they were also asking about a moving flat glow discharge. And this was something I thought might be in your notes, perhaps, that I'd missed when I read through them. Uh, well, in order to make uh, the video for, for the uh, flat glow discharge, uh, we should use a high-speed uh, video camera, which uh, we don't have at present, so we just uh, want to rely on our uh, key insight, but uh, it's a bit difficult. Uh, we're planning uh, to make it, but uh, even with uh, normal eye, uh, when we have uh, normal discharge, I mean a spark, uh, as in Van de Graaff generator, or a flat glow discharge, which repeats the configuration of a meter, it's possible to see it with your own eyes. We don't need any camera for this. Oh, okay. Well, just to wrap things up, because we're almost out of time, again, it sounds like you're getting amazing results. You're able to actually, you know, put holes through concrete and bend metals with this at 5 million volts. Um, you know, these are remarkable results. Is there anything you'd like to say in close? I don't think that uh, these results are remarkable. Uh, in general, uh, this subject called um, experimental gravity research, it has a very big potential. And uh, if we compare uh, the, uh, how complicated pro this problem is to the problem of, let's say, nuclear explosion, uh, I think that uh, gravity research is much more complicated. But uh, even uh, if we speak about uh, nuclear power, uh, there was a period in the United States when uh, everybody was interested and uh, military people wanted to make uh, uh, some researches and uh, the government was interested. And then people came and said, could you please make a small explosion? And then we will, make, we will give you money for a big one. And um, it's impossible to make a small nuclear explosion somewhere under ventilation. The same thing refers to gravity. It's an enormous problem. And uh, we can't uh, get much if we uh, don't have an organized approach as it was in the nuclear program, for example, in the United States. So only combining the knowledge of uh, different fields, of different physicists and chemists and material scientists, theoretical physicists, uh, only uh, making them work together, we can uh, make a breakthrough in this field because it's a very, very serious research. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for your time, and we definitely look forward to following up with you uh, more in the future. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Working with the rotating disks, definitely. And uh, we had some, uh, some experience with this, but with uh, gravity impulse generator, we simply didn't organize any measurements. Absolutely. That, that makes perfect sense. Well, you know, I, I was wondering, on a personal note, um, you'd mentioned that this was uh, over hundreds of pounds of force for a very short period of time. And I'd wondered, um, has, this, uh, has this been able to punch holes through lightweight substances, or is it more of just kind of a motion on them? Uh, it all depends on the uh, voltage that we apply and also on the structure of the superconducting emitter. So at the maximum possibility of our materials at present, uh, we can obtain um, rather um, big impulses, so they are able uh, to deform uh, metal plates uh, with a thickness of a couple of inches, and uh, they are able to make holes in concrete walls. I'm Tim Ventura from AmericanAntiGravity.com, and this is a follow-up interview with Dr. Eugene Poglanoff, world-famous Russian physicist and chemist known for his work into gravitational waves and gravity beam generation. During our previous interview, Dr. Pogklinov told us that he'd been able to generate hundreds of pounds of force in beams of pure gravitational energy, and we're conducting a follow-up interview to learn a little bit more about the details of his experiment. Uh, Dr. Pogklinov, can you hear me okay? I read you perfectly. One of the responses that we had online was, uh, with nearly a decade of experience, why haven't we been able to see video or photos of your experiments up until now? 
Uh, well, first of all, when I began uh, those experiments in Finland, in Tampere, uh, it's not a habit here uh, in Finland to make any videos or photos of the equipment or of the experiment. It's typical for the United States, but here in Europe it's a bit uh, different. And the same thing uh, goes for Russia, uh, especially with the last... Our plans are, are really amazing and uh, we need... Um, considerable funding. So this uh, topic, uh, gravity, is, uh, first of all, it is a bit unusual, and uh, we need some exotic material, we need uh, special installations, we need cryogenic systems, uh, also we need the help of people who are uh, top qualified in their own areas, and uh, this all uh, costs a lot. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, with uh, with the actual testing, one of the, the questions that had occurred to me when I was, you know, when I sat down and took a little bit of time was, um, it, you know, as these are presumed to be gravity beams, have you noticed any time effects? Um, uh, it's uh, difficult to say because uh, it's not uh, practically a gravity beam, it's a gravity impulse, so it's very short in time. And because of these limitations, as it is short in time, we didn't notice any time effects and didn't even try to measure. Maybe they are present. Uh, they are definitely present when we have experiment uh, in the uh, Moscow Chemical Research Center because uh, the whole center is uh, a very complicated structure and some of the works are closed for wide public. They are not secret, but they are simply dangerous because we use uh, high voltage, um, several million volts, so they are closed. And, uh, 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 well, we have special signs on the walls of the laboratory which do not allow to make any photos. It's the policy which is accepted at this uh, scientific uh, center. So I didn't want to change the rules. Oh, absolutely. Well, in light of the publicity they've had recently, have you given thought to doing any photos or video in the near future? Uh, I think uh, I will try to make uh, something. Uh, I discussed uh, this possibility uh, with the administration. They think it might be possible. But uh, at present we have uh, no videos and uh, no photos at all. Oh, okay. Well, I look forward uh, to hopefully receiving some in the future, um, you know, I if it turns out that it is possible. Well, to move along, um, have you been able to obtain uh, funding from government or private interests? Has there been uh, a fair amount of interest that's come forward and uh, tried to provide some funding for your experiments? Uh, there is a certain interest uh, from uh, several circuits, but it's uh, private sector mainly because uh, governmental policy towards uh, all the research in the field of gravity and experimental gravity um, is uh, it's not a popular trend, so uh, we don't get much money from the government. Uh, of course, we use the uh, ready installations at the technological center, but um, there is uh, some interest uh, in general all over the world and in the United States and Great Britain, but uh, uh, we didn't get any funding from the government. Uh, we get uh, a rather small funding from uh, private sector, as I mentioned, but uh, 